One of the things Taylor says is that there are a number of different ways to try and deal with the orientation of an object and a rotation in three dimensions. And a lot, if not all of them, are surprisingly cumbersome. And this is sadly and unfortunately true. Rotation around just one axis, which is why in introductory physics, this is all we ever do is rotation around one axis, um, is not so bad. Um, and rolling without slipping, and you can do all that. But as you've seen, I mean, even if, even if you're not dealing with off diagonal terms on the inertia tensor, um, dealing with rotation is hard. So, so we had the Euler equations for rotation, which seem nice, but they're about an instantaneous set of axes that is not going to be the same set the next instant you have the omega. So they're awkward to use and, you know, we can work with it, but they're awkward. And the Euler angles themselves are fairly awkward to work with. Um, and just the problem is, is that um, rotations are more complicated than linear motion. Sorry, deal with it. Um, so the Euler angles, um, in fact, if you go to the Wikipedia article on Euler angles, if, and you will discover that there's um, 12 standard conventional definitions of Euler angles, whoops, um, with extrinsic and intrinsic matrices, which uh, matrices makes everything harder if you're using intrinsic, which we are. Um, so this is one set of Euler angles. I think this is the one that's most commonly used by physicists. It's certainly the one I've seen in mechanics textbooks before. It starts, and so the, all right, so the purpose of Euler angles is to describe a, uniquely describe an orientation of an object in space. And so you can get any object's orientation in space um, relative to some fiducial orientation. Um, so here you start and you've got all, all right, so I've got the axes, X, Y, and Z. You start with a rotation of phi um, about the Z axis. And so now we have the X prime, Y prime, and Z prime axes. I'm naming this slightly different than uh, Taylor for reasons. Um, you have the X prime, Y prime, and Z prime axes. Um, the Z prime axis is the same as the Z axis because that's the one you rotated around, but now X prime and Y prime are offset. So far, it's not so bad. The rotation matrix would just have, um, it'd be a cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine thing. Not so bad. Um, now, uh, we want to rotate by theta about the Y prime axis. And you will recognize now that the Z double prime axis um, is that vector. If you, if you uh, take the end of that vector and you call that R, um, then the theta and the phi is exactly the theta and the phi of spherical coordinates, right? So you can imagine for spherical coordinates, um, if you start with a point somewhere up on the Z axis and you do the first two Euler rotations on it, um, you now have um, the spherical coordinates of that point, uh, or theta and phi will be the spherical coordinates, you know, plus whatever its distance is, of that point. Um, and then, all right, and now, of course, now the x double prime axis is offset from the x prime and the x axis. The y double prime and y prime axes are the same because that's what we rotated around. Um, at one more rotation, now we rotate around the Z double prime axis. And I remember when I very first learned about these, I thought, wait, why are we rotating around Z again? And we're not. We're rotating around Z double prime, which is not the same as Z. We rotate by Psi around Z double prime. And when all is said and done, these three angles, Phi, Theta, and Psi, um, for certain values of these angles, so the, uh, yeah, Theta will go from 0 to pi, phi goes from 0 to 2 pi, and psi goes from 0 to 2 pi. You can orient anything in any direction. Um, now, if all you wanted to do was say, where is the point in space, you only need theta and phi, and that's why spherical coordinates, that's all it has, is the point in space, theta and phi. But that's not all we're trying to do here. We're not trying to um, locate a point. We're trying to orient an extended object, right? All of this rigid, rigid body rotation has been about extended objects. If we just have particles, there's no extent to them. You don't need any of this. Also, there's no or there's no spin angular momentum for, for point particles because they have no angular or no um, moment of inertia. Um, anyway, um, about their center because their center is all of them. Um, so, so you know, to be clear, we it's not just finding a point in space, but it's the full-on orientation. So I'll start here with this uh, woman who used to watch the Foucault pendulum. Um, and if we do the three rotations, so we start with the phi rotation about the z-axis, and then we do the theta rotation about the new, the y-prime axis. 
Um, and so in that, now you can have her head at any point in space from those first two rotations. But notice that which way she is facing um, is there's only one way she can face um, given where her head is if we use these two rotations to get here. So we need one more rotation and we can just rotate by psi um, around her body now and now she can face in any direction and that's where the orientation comes in. Uh, that's the Euler angles, right? So then working with the Euler angles is actually kind of difficult. Um, now, one thing you can try, um, there's a, I was fairly deep in a fairly nasty rabbit hole most of this afternoon uh, playing with rotation matrices. Um, one, there, you can try and build the rotation matrix that goes with the Euler rotations. It's kind of long when you get to it, but it's not so horrible, but getting there is kind of challenging. Uh, because you're rotating around, so the first rotation is easy. You're rotating around Z, a rotation matrix like that is easy. This next rotation, hard, because now you're not rotating around X, Y, or Z. You're rotating around Y prime, which is off at some bizarro angle. And honestly, the way I figured out the rotation matrix, and I'm not 100% sure I did it right, I used quaternions. What are those? That's another way of talking about rotations. Quaternions, um, basically the way it works is that... Um, a quaternion represents a rotation in the form of a unit vector that is the axis of the rotation, and it's oriented. And then the angle, which is the right-handed rotation around that unit vector. Um, so that's that's how you represent a quaternion. Uh, exactly how you represent the components are not that important, but given those two things, you can understand that can represent a rotation. Um, so, and it's, it's pretty easy to write down the components of a of a quaternion if you know that unit vector and you know the rotation, whereas it's really hard to write down the components of the um, rotation matrix if you know the thing you're rotating around, unless it happens to be one of the three cardinal axes. So um, they get pretty nasty. Um, I do want to do a little bit about rotation matrices, though. All right, so we're going to start in two dimensions. So here's the basic problem. You have your x and your y axes, and I have some vector v, which I'll, I'll I'll describe the vector, I'll put its uh, tail at the origin, and I want to rotate it to some new vector, V prime, and I want to rotate it by theta, and if you, uh, I will just stick in 2D, but if this was 3D, the z-axis to be a right-handed coordinate system, the z-axis would have to stick out of the page, but we won't worry about the z-axis yet. I want to rotate by theta. Well, so it turns out, um, basically what I want, right now I have my components Vx and Vy, I want to find the components of V prime x, and v prime y. Um, it's a whole new vector, right? I have rotated the vector. It's now pointing in a different direction. Um, you can get v prime x and v prime y written as a column vector here by multiplying this matrix, cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta, times the original vector, vx, vy, right? So that's just a simple rotation matrix. That's will rotate the vector by theta. Um, and, you know, as a simple example, let's just imagine that you wanted to rotate x hat, right? So here's x and here's y. x hat, of course, is just along the x-axis. If you want to rotate it x hat by theta, well, so looking at that, um, you can go ahead and do a right triangle. You can take down here. You can figure out that this rotated thing should have um, components cosine theta comma sine theta, right? Because it's just a little right triangle. Well, go ahead and do this rotation matrix. Cosine theta, I'm running out of space. I'm going to write smaller. Sine theta, sine, that's minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. And if I multiply that by x hat, well, now the matrix multiplication is not very hard, right? So if you don't know how to do it, ask somebody who does. Um, cosine theta times 1 minus sine theta times 0, that gives you cosine theta. And the second one, sine theta times 1 um, plus cosine theta times 0 gives you sine theta, right? So it gives you the right thing. By the way, um, one of the things about these rotation matrices, they're easy to remember once you realize the, the cosines are on the axes and the sines are off. What's hard is remembering, does the negative sign go there or there? And this is how I figure it out. I think about what happens if I rotate x hat, and that's how I can figure out where the negative sign needs to go. If theta equals zero, this is the identity matrix, right? So if theta is equal to zero, this matrix is one, zero, zero, one, because cosine of zero is one and sine zero, zero. And that uh, a, a lack of a rotation should give you exactly the same vector that you started with. So that's good. 
Now, there is a subtlety that comes in here. Sometimes what you want to do is actually something a little different, right? I've got the x and the y axes, and I have some vector, which you can think of. It can also just be a point in space, right? Whatever, it's a vector. Um, and I, I know its components. I want to find its components in a rotated coordinate six system, x prime, y prime. And if you think about Euler angles, you can see why this would be an important relevant thing to do, where the coordinate system is rotated by angle theta. Um, OK, so how do you figure out what that is? Um, well, here's how you can figure out what that is. Let's start. Um, well, instead of start, let's draw the x and y prime frames like this, x prime, y prime, right? And so then the x is like this, and y is like that. And now you notice the vector is at some angle off of the x-axis, which we'll say was something like that, right? So this angle is the same as that angle. Well, what have I done here? You'll notice that I rotated the coordinate system down by theta is exactly what I did, right? Because it, it was theta to go from, to rotate x up to x prime. So rotating x prime down to x is the same as rotating by theta. And where this vector um, used to be, if, uh, not really used to be, but this this is the thing that would have the components in the prime system if it had the same components in the x system. And that angle is also theta. So if you want to rotate the coordinate system, Right, so this, so you have to make sure you, you know what question you're asking. Do I want to take a body and reorient it? Uh, in that case, you use the rotation matrix I already gave you, and that's what we're doing with Euler angles. If you have a vector in one coordinate system and you want to find its components in another coordinate system, so here we'll call this V, and I'm going to be careful, my notation, it looks the same, but it's not. I'm going to have V sub X prime, and notice the prime is on the x, not on the v. Before it was a different vector. Now it's the same vector, just components along different basis axes, right? If you're rotating the coordinate system, it's just like going backwards, right? So you put a negative theta for theta, but of course we know that sine theta is odd and cosine theta is even, so the, the signs come out like that. So you have to use a backwards rotation matrix if you want to rotate. Um, if you want to rotate your coordinate system, right? And so then um, what you can do is, so then you can come up um, without too much trouble with rotation matrices um, in 3D to rotate around the z-axis. Um, so that will rotate a vector, change the orientation of the vector by a rotation of theta around the plus z-axis. This will um, rotate the vector, change its orientation by theta, around the plus x axis, and you'll notice it's very similar, right? It's just that now the x is the thing that's got one because x is the component that won't change if you're rotating about x. And then here's the y axis. Um, you have to be a little careful with the y axis because of where the negative signs are. Um, if you draw the picture, I mean, anyway, just use your right hand and make sure you're drawing things in the right direction and you can figure out where the negative sign needs to be. So you've got those three rotation matrices that can rotate around the x, y, and z axes. Now, in principle, you ought to be able to use those to build up the um, Euler angles, build up a rotation matrix for the Euler angles. But it turns out it's actually kind of hard because you can't just straight up multiply these matrices together. A rotation around the z axis followed by a rotation around the y axis, you could build that just by multiplying r, y times times RZ, matrix multiplication, you'd have a single matrix to do those two rotations together. Hooray. But that's not what Euler angles are doing, right? It's a rotation around the Z axis, followed by a rotation around something that is at angle phi with respect to the Y axis. Yeah, right? And then another thing that's at yet another angle. So um, coming up with those rotation matrices is a little bit more challenging. But um, if, if I did it right, it does reduce to something kind of tractable. It's kind of long, um, and I will put the Maxima file I use to generate this online if you're interested in seeing how I got this rotation matrix. You can then use that as a rotation matrix either to reorient something from the inertial frame into the body frame, so to reorient the body, or remembering that um, you use the inverse matrix, so inverse of a rotation is just you flip the angle on the sign. You use the inverse matrix to to rotate the coordinate system. So if you want to find, if you have something and you know its coordinates in the body system, you can use this matrix to rotate 
back to the inertial system. Why? Because you're, you're going, you're doing the backwards rotation. So you think that was the inverse, but you're rotating coordinates. So you use the inverse matrix. So that's if you have the components of a vector in the body frame, um, you could then use this Euler matrix to find the components in the inertial frame. And you can see where that would be useful. Um, and then finally, if you want to rotate a tensor, if you want to, all right, so we have, we know the inertia tensor of an object in its body frame. It's diagonal with the lambdas on the um, axes. You could then find the inertia tensor in the inertial frame uh, by doing this with the Euler matrix, where capital R there represents the Euler matrix. Um, so when you when you do a tensor, you actually don't just multiply the matrix once, you have to multiply it twice, uh, and then you have to transpose it once, so it gets, it's more involved, but whatever. It's matrix multiplication. At that point, you can do it, and um, uh, you will get something very long. But whatever, you can try and work with it. Now, um, uh, Taylor works with it, and he works out the precession of a top, and I'm not going to redo everything he did. I'm going I'm to go through some of it. Um, I'm not going to redo everything that he did, um, but... You know, he works in a, in a simpler case where he has two of the lambdas are the same as each other. So you can be a little more cavalier about the psi rotation in that case, um, because um, that psi rotation, um, anything in that final orange plane there, any two axes along there will be principal axes, any two perpendicular ones, because of the symmetry. You've got rotational symmetry. Um, uh, that's what he was assuming. And so so you, your principal axes can be anything, and so he takes advantage of that. And he does a... a uh, he does the, the top and comes up with this precession and mutation. Um, from my own point of view, if what you're really interested in is doing a numerical solution, um, I'm not convinced I would want to use the Euler angles. Um, you know, one way to handle rotations is quaternions, but actually I think the way I would like is the code that I posted last time, uh, where we use the Euler equations, right? There's the Euler angle and Euler's equations. Oh my goodness, Euler, you've named too many things. Um, for the Euler's equations for rotation, those are the ones, the lambda 1, omega 1 dot minus lambda 2 minus lambda 3 times omega 2 and omega 3 equals gamma 1, if I remembered it correctly. All those equations like that, plus the equations for the derivatives of the unit vectors of the body. And then that's some, if I wanted to do it numerically, partly because I've already done it, um, that's probably what I would use rather than solving for phi theta and psi. There is one other little problem with phi theta and psi. And that is when theta is zero, phi and psi are degenerate with each other. Right? So this is what's called gimbal lock. Um, you can look up what a gimbal is. It's a it's nested um, circles with uh, that can rotate with each other. It basically can do the Euler rotations. Um, if you get phi and psi lined up in the middle of your differential equation, well, a bunch of things will happen. One, some of your differential equations will be you divide by psi and theta, so now you're dividing by zero. But you also have the problem that if you rotate in psi or in phi, it means the same thing. So you've lost some of your rotation there, and so you uh, so you can get stuck. Um, your solutions will crap out when it gets to that. And that's one of the reasons uh, lots of people actually use quaternions for rotations, because they don't have that problem. Um, all right, so uh, rotation matrices. So now let's dig in right out. So what have we got here? Um, so the first thing, uh, phi theta and psi are a series of transformations that tell us how to go from the inertial frame to the body frame. And so the rate of change of those transformations is the rotation of the body. And so you can write the rotation of the body, omega, as a vector is equal to phi dot z hat plus theta dot y prime hat plus psi dot z double prime hat. Okay, now, um, if you evaluate these unit vectors, if you get their components in, well, any frame, whichever frame or whichever coordinate system you get these unit vectors components in, you now have the components of omega in that system. Now, this should scare you a little bit. You have no problem, I hope, by thinking that, you know, if I have a I have an object that's moving at speed v um, relative to the box, but then the box is moving, at, you know, velocity v here, that relative to the ground, um, the little ball is just is moving at v plus v, right? That's, uh, 
just linear addition of velocities just works out straight until you get to special relativity, and then it doesn't anymore. But uh, in you know classical mechanics, non-relativistic mechanics, you can just linearly add velocities like that. You should hesitate before thinking, can I just linearly add these? If you think about it, what is this saying? This first one, phi dot z hat. Well, phi is a rotation around the original z axis, so phi dot z hat, that is the omega vector of that part of the transformation. And then theta dot y prime hat, well, y prime hat is the, or theta dot, it's rotating at theta dot around y prime hat right now instantaneously, so that is part of the omega. And likewise, it's rotating at psi, or, or it has a rotation psi around z hat double prime, and so psi prime, z hat double prime, is that part of the rotation. Psi, the, this rotation is on top of this rotation, which in turn is on top of this rotation. Um, so that's very much like this case, where this is within this motion. Um, can you just add angular velocities like that? And the answer is yes, you can, but you shouldn't think that it's obvious. So go back to section 9.3. He works out that you can do it. Um, but just always with rotation like this, be worried that you're, you're making too many rash assumptions. Now, a few things to note here. Z double prime is equal to E3, the body. Ooh, that's a nice three. The body axis, because the last rotation from the double prime to the body axis um, was around the Z axis. So you just have that. And also Y prime is equal to Y double prime. Um, we're going to use that a little bit later. Why? Because again, the rotation from prime to double prime was around the y axis. Okay, so um, we want to use this. What do we want to do with it? Well, we can do all kinds of stuff with it. But let's do the Taylor thing with it. And let's do the, the simplified case that um, psi 1 is equal to psi 2. And that's the case I was just talking about, where um, anything in the plane that is shared by the double prime x and y axes and the e1 and e2 axes, right? So, right, so that, that kind of brown orange plane there. Um, any two perpendicular axes in those planes are principal axes in this case, in the case where lambda one equals lambda two. I think I'm mixing up all my Greek letters now. Um, because that's that's like a cylinder. That's something that's got rotational symmetry. Where those two principal axes are the same, it turns out that any principal axes, and it doesn't actually have to really have rotational symmetry, but if it has these two principal axes like that, then any two principal axes in the, any two perpendicular things in the same plane work as principal axes. And that lets us be a little cavalier and say, oh, well, let's not, let's just go ahead and use X hat double prime, Y hat double prime, and Z hat double prime instead of E1, E2, E3. And why? Because some of those are already here, right? Like this, like this. Um, Z hat double prime already is E3, but instead we're just going to use these because they're in the same plane as E1 and E2 and they're principal axes too. So let's go ahead and work out what's going on around them. So to do this, we need components of stuff. So we already have right, y hat double prime is the same as y hat prime. We already have z hat double prime. So we need z in the um, double prime axis. Well, so I'm going to try and draw a picture here. So this is the original z axis. And this is something in the xy plane. But it's actually tilted at angle phi with respect to the x axis. So what we're going to be looking at is the second transformation around theta. So that transformation is going to take you to um, z double prime here and x double prime here. And it's got to be x down, not up, right? Because you're rotated by theta uh, about the plus y axis. And if you use your right hand, you'll see that uh, plus y prime um, is out of the page here. So that's what the theta rotation does. It takes something in the xy plane, rotates x double prime down like that. So let's look at z hat. Right, z hat is that way, and then we have the z double prime axis that way, and the, well, this is the minus x double prime axis, right, and that's theta. So z hat is equal to cosine theta in the z double prime direction minus sine theta in the x double prime direction, right, because to get z hat you have to do that vector plus that vector, and this vector is opposite the direction of x double prime. All right, so 
now that we have this, we can stick this back up in there and we have everything in the double prime axis. So let's do that next. All right, so now we can just write omega is equal to phi dot. Now let's substitute in for z hat in terms of the double prime things. Z double prime cosine theta. And remember again, this double prime coordinate system is a principal coordinate system for the body only because of the symmetry that we're assuming. So what we're doing right now is not general. Um, plus x double prime sine theta, right, um, plus theta dot y hat double prime, because y hat prime and y hat double prime are the same thing, plus psi dot z hat double prime, all right? Uh, that's all well and good. Um, so let's go ahead. If you If you solve this out, Basically, what I want to do is collect all the z double prime terms together. Um, you'll end up with a minus phi dot sine theta times x double prime plus theta dot y double prime um, plus psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta z double prime. And incidentally, the whole gimbal lock thing, if theta is equal to zero, um, you don't have anything keeping track of your x double prime uh, angular velocity anymore, and there might be some, right? And then psi prime, psi, uh, psi dot and phi dot, if theta is zero, they're, they're, they both function exactly the same because there's no cosine theta because okay, cosine theta is one. Anyway, that's that whole issue there. Okay, so now that we have omega, what can we do with it? Well, um, lots of things, but one of the things we could do is think about energy. So let's do that. And again, reminding you, the, pro the double primed axes are principal axes for the body. So what that means is that mistakes have just been made. What that means is that I can write the kinetic energy T is equal to 1 half lambda 1 omega x double prime squared squared plus 1 half lambda 2 which is the same as lambda 1, right? Omega y double prime squared plus 1 half lambda 3. Omega z double prime squared, right? Because x double prime, y double prime, z double prime are just as much principal axes of these bodies, um, of this body as e1, e2, e3 is in the case where lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, um, which means that we can combine all these things together. Um, let's go ahead. I'm going to skip a step. Um, and combine two things together, and you'll see what I did. It's actually not that hard. T is equal to lambda 1 over 2 times, uh, well, basically, I'm going to have wx double prime squared plus wy double prime squared, right? I've just factored out the lambda. That's why I'm not, it's not a hard step that I'm skipping. Phi dot squared sine squared theta, that's uh, wx double prime and plus theta dot squared, right? And then I have plus lambda 3 over 2, and lambda 3 could be different. We're not dealing with a sphere here times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta quantity squared. All right, that is the kinetic energy of this body, right? And um, then we are, remember, talking about like this top thing, right? So it's like that could be a disk. Uh, so if that distance is r, um, you know, we have the force of gravity, fg is mg down like that. And this angle theta is the Euler theta, right? It's the angle between the z and the z double prime axis. That's what Euler theta is, right? Because the z double prime axis is also the E3 axis. Um, always, just that's how Euler angles are defined. So that is the Euler theta, so we can use that. And just looking at this, in fact, I don't even need the, um, I don't even need the force of gravity there. We just need this distance. Well, because that's theta, this is also theta, that's gonna be a cosine our potential energy is just going to be mgr cosine theta, where r is the uh, distance from this pivot point to the center of mass here. Right? Then theta, of course, is the angle in that case. So now we can get our Lagrangian. Lagrangian is equal to lambda 1 over 2 times phi dot squared sine squared theta plus theta dot squared plus lambda 3 over 2 times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta quantity squared minus mgr cosine theta. All right.
All right, so here's some things I want to look at. Notice that the Lagrangian does not depend on either phi or psi, right? It doesn't depend on phi or psi. It depends on phi dot and psi dot, but it doesn't depend on phi or psi. Um, and what that, when you have something like that, that tells you that, so remember the generalized momentum uh, or the, the phi component of generalized momentum, phi being one of our generalized coordinates, we're using the Euler angle here as our generalized coordinates, is defined as partial L partial phi. Um, well, the Euler Lagrange equation is going to say that d by dt of partial L partial phi, sorry, partial L partial phi dot, I said that wrong before, um, is going to be equal to partial L partial phi, but partial L partial phi is zero. So this is going to be a constant. Partial L partial phi dot is going to be a constant. Let's work out what it is. Um, let's not yet. I want to do the other one first. We also have P, P psi, right? The psi component of generalized momentum. This is also going to be a constant because once again, um, in the Euler Lagrange equation, the partial L partial psi term doesn't exist. So this thing d by dt of this is zero, which means this is a constant. I want to do this one because this derivative is not very hard to do. Psi dot only shows up in one place. Um, it's in that squared thing. And so uh, what's going to happen is you're just going to have the square to cancel the the one half and you'll get psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta, right? That is P psi. It's a conserved quantity. So we're going to define it to be L3. It does turn out, this is not immediately obvious, but it does turn out that this is the same as the component of angular momentum about the body axis, or sorry, along the body axis, right? How do you know? Well, I could also have done, um, I could have worked out L3 uh, was equal to um, lambda 3 omega z. In fact, here it is. We're just doing it right now. Um, omega z double prime. And you would have discovered, oh, this is exactly what. So L3 is a conserved quantity, and that's kind of nice. So then what does what is P5 work out to be? The derivative is a little less pleasant. It's not terrible. It's just a little bit longer. Um, works out to be lambda 1 sine squared theta times phi dot. It's a phi dot um, plus lambda 3 times cosine theta times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta, right? Or you could write this also as lambda 1 sine squared theta phi dot plus L3 cosine theta, right? Because notice L3 was just in there. So that's P phi. This is also a conserved quantity. This if you go back and you look at the angular momentum thing, is equal to the angular momentum in the z direction, right? So the torques are always in the xy plane. So angular momentum in the z direction should be conserved. And hey, look, it is. Um, so look at Taylor equation 10.102 if you want to see these angular momentums. Uh, all right, so we have these two conserved things. Knowing that they're conserved, what we can do is go back and look at the Lagrangian and notice in the Lagrangian, I've got uh, this right here is uh, just that term in parentheses is L3 squared divided by lambda 3 squared, right? So I can get entirely rid of that. The other thing I want to do is let's get rid of phi dot. Why? Because we can. Let's get rid of phi dot um, because you can get phi dot in terms of these constants, P phi and P psi. Um, I won't actually do the algebra. I trust you to be able to do that algebra. Um, but if you work it out, you can show that phi dot is equal to LZ minus L3 cosine theta, where I had another terms with psi dot in it, and I got rid of that by using the L3 thing divided by lambda 1 sine squared theta. And what's nice about this is the only variable in it is theta. And so now, knowing this phi dot and knowing that psi dot, we can substitute those back in to the total energy of the system, which is the kinetic energy. So that is the T that we had before, but now I'm going to substitute in for phi dot here. That's LZ minus L3 cosine theta divided by lambda 1 sine squared theta. So I've just substituted for um, 
phi dot there, which was squared, times sine squared theta, um, plus theta dot squared, um, plus LZ squared over 2 lambda 3, right? That was that other term that I pointed out before. Um, I canceled the lambda 3 squared in the denominator with a lambda in the numerator, and then we still have the potential energy plus MGR cosine theta. But now, what I want to do is um, separate out the phi dot term so that we have E is equal to lambda 1 over 2 phi dot squared plus LZ minus L3 cosine theta squared divided by lambda 1 sine squared theta, where I've canceled one of the lambda 1s down here with a lambda 1 from the numerator. Um, I wonder what happened to that 2. Pretty sure there should still be a 2 here, so I'm going to put it in. Check that, see if I'm wrong. Um, and also the sine squared, I hit the sine squared in the numerator, sine to the fourth in the denominator, got rid of them. Plus LZ squared over 2 lambda 3, plus, that's a lambda, MGR cosine theta. And notice what I have, this thing boxed only depends on theta. So what I was telling you last time about the planetary orbits, where you got um, an energy equation that had an R dot and an R term, this looks very much like, here's a, that looks like a kinetic energy term, doesn't it? It's an I omega squared, right? That's a kinetic energy. This looks like a potential energy. Now we know hidden inside LZ and L3 are phi dots and psi dots. But they are put together in such a way that they give us constants. LZ and L3 are constants of the motion. So they're just constants, right? So when you take derivatives of stuff, the derivative of LZ is going to be zero. It, even though it has phi dots and psi dots in it, they'll come together in such a way that the derivative is zero. So we call this U effective of theta because mathematically it works just like a potential energy. And then looking at that can give us, us a sense of how the thing's going to oscillate around. So um, if you make a plot of U effective of theta, well, so I chose a random set of parameters. I had to futz around for a while to find one that looked the way I wanted it to look. Um, if you play with this, you can very easily find minima with three theta greater than pi over 2, which means your top has hit the ground. But maybe it's hanging in space, and that's fine. Whatever, you can do it. Um, anyway, so you notice here there is a minimum, which means there is a stable point that if I start at exactly that theta, it will stay at that theta. Right, because um, partial L, if you write L as T minus U effective, partial L, partial theta is zero because theta only shows up now in the U effective term. Um, so uh, phi double dot's gonna have to be zero. Um, and if you start there, and if you start with theta dot zero, it will stay there with theta dot zero um, and theta at this minimum here. Um, and that's what I showed you with the processing top before. How do I find this? Take a derivative of this with respect to theta and set it to zero, like the way you always find minima of things. This also means that if you have um, your U effective is a little bigger than the minimum U effective, theta will oscillate back and forth because you've got a nice minimum here. Now, this very clearly doesn't look exactly like a simple harmonic oscillator. It's a little mangled in shape, so the oscillations won't be nice and sinusoidal, but there will be oscillations. There's a smooth curve, and I'll go back and forth on it. And then Taylor works out and thinks about some cases of those where you get curly cues um, versus bouncing up and down, and I showed you some of those before with the numerical solutions. So what, all right, so the purpose of all this is to show you that thinking about Euler angles, now, all right, who came up with this first? Huh, I don't think I could have come up with this first. I mean, you know me. What I do is I try to get the basic equations and freaking numerically solve them and see what it does. Um, but this does show by analyzing Euler angles, you can figure out things about how a symmetric top will bob around. And the symmetric top is not as contrived a case as you might think. You know, there's a fair number of things that have a proximal, approximate cylindrical symmetry, like for like an airplane propeller. Right, an airplane propeller will have um, one axis perpendicular to the plane of the propeller, and then it turns out that um, any two axes um, in the, uh, assuming your propeller is built well, and this wouldn't be a propeller with just two propels, but like four, right? So one, two, three, four. Um, any two axes uh, will be principal axes. So that's a case to which this would apply. And precession and nutation of airplane propellers is something you care about. Because if your airplane 
propeller gets tilted off a little bit and it starts processing around. That's exerting a torque on the thing holding on the shaft, holding the propeller in place. And if you exert torques there, there's too much to hold it in place. Your propeller is going to break or fall off and your plane's going to fall out of the sky and that's bad. So this is, you know, these kinds of cases are not as contrived as they seem. Um, uh, and this does show you that you can work out things about the sorts of things that will happen by thinking about these Euler angles. Now, using it generally, pretty hard, right? These are pretty Byzantine little things. Um, so that's it for rotation. We are now going to go on and look at the theory of coupled oscillators in more depth. We've talked about coupled oscillators before, mostly in recognizing that there's coupled because there's springs connecting things to each other and because the DEs get in each other's business. Well, start reading. We're going to talk about normal modes and uh, resonant frequencies of coupled oscillators and things like that. That's it.